In this video, Jordan Peterson talks about the utopian thinking and the dangers of it. I've been reading this book recently, which the title of I can't remember, unfortunately, but I'll tell it to you after class. It's a, it's a critique of certain lines of left-wing ideological thinking, including the, the existential thought of people like Jean-Paul Sartre and Foucault. And one of the most trenchant critiques of Sartre, because he, he believes that you sort of have an absolute freedom, that you're destined for freedom, uh, that you're doomed to it in some sense, and that part of your existential journey is to establish an authenticity that's correct for you. But he doesn't, he isn't able really to give any description of what that should be grounded in. And the critic concludes that all Sartre can do is stand outside of any potential belief system and criticize it. And that that's there's nothing in it for anyone as a consequence of that. It's, it's only destructive. <clears throat> now, it's important to remember with regards to Sartre that he viewed other people to some degree, like the common man, the bourgeoisie, we might say, as the embodiment of non-freedom, of inauthenticity, and also as a barrier to genuine authenticity. So he wasn't willing to give any credence to the utility of normality, but I also think he wasn't able to tolerate the consequences of his own thought because he was an avid supporter of the Communist Party far after anyone with any reasonable moral sense would have stopped doing that. So Sartre really didn't denounce the Communists until the end of the beginning of the 70s, roughly speaking. He was never a card-carrying Communist, but he was very, very left-leaning. And, you know, by, by the 1970s, by the late 60s, by the, by the early 70s, a lot of the evidence about what was going on in Soviet Russia had been in for 30 years. You know. So there was really no excuse for not facing up to that and trying to understand what it meant. And it you know, would be bad enough if it was just the Soviet Union, but it wasn't. The same th sort of thing happened wherever those utopian pre, uh, presuppositions were put into place. And I suppose many of you don't know this, but Paul Pot, who was the... Cambodian dictator was educated at the Sorbonne, and he wrote his thesis on the, he wrote his, I think it was his PhD thesis, although it might have been his master's thesis, on the Marxist doctrine that, the, that uh, urban people were parasites on rural people. So he, you know, there's a theory that says that the genuine value is, is generated purely by labor and much of that's rural labor, and the cities siphon off excess productive power and are able to parasitize the countryside as a consequence of that, and which is a you know, tremendously non-productive theory. But Paul Pot put it into practice, and so when he went back into Cambodia, he chased everybody out of the cities and killed about six million people. So, you know, you can read about that if you want. It's a pretty appalling section of, of 20th century history, you know, especially when it's the case that he was, in it, you know, he was educated in the West and had these presuppositions drummed into him. Well, and then there's Foucault. Foucault, who I have no respect for, by the way. I think, I think I've read a fair bit of Foucault, and I think everything he says is obvious. So, for example, he criticizes the idea of mental illness as a, as a social construct. It's like, well, yeah, obviously. I mean, it's not like psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health professionals who are relatively well-informed haven't known about that since for the last 60 years. I mean, it might be a revelation to people who, who don't notice that psychi psychiatry, for example, is something like a compromise between the patient, biology, and the social world. You know, I mean, psychiatric ailments often have a biological tilt, but the way they manifest themselves in society is clearly conditioned in, in very intense ways by the particular um, 
conditions obtaining at the point that the person who has that biological predisposition exists, even whether or not that's pathological, can be tilted one way or another by the by cultural norms. And then, of course, when you're dealing with issues like insurance payment and treatment and hospitalization, obviously you're pulling in all sorts of systems that are by no means purely scientific, but I don't find it a particularly useful critique. It's obvious as far as I'm concerned. And the other thing that Foucault did, I mean, I think this is the typical, especially the French intellectuals, typical sleight of hand once Marxism became, you know, once you were no longer able to call yourself a committed Marxist because committed Marxism had led to unbelievable brutality, you know, on a scale that had never probably, I think, had never been experienced in the entire history of the planet, at least in terms of its reach and duration. You didn't get to call yourself a Marxist anymore, although there were still people, and you still see them saying, well, that wasn't real Marxism, which I think is a cop-out of staggering proportions. It usually means, well, if I was the person running the country, that wouldn't have happened. You know, that's the logic behind it. They didn't put the principles into practice properly. It's like, yeah, well, lots of people put the damn principles into practice, and the same thing happened everywhere. So at some point, you have to kind of wonder if there's something wrong with the principles. Anyways, what Foucault did was take the Marxist presupposition that everything was could be boiled down to economics and economic power and translated it into the idea that everything just boiled down to power. You know, and that the reason that we have institutions is to include and to exclude, and that the institutions always run for the benefit of those at the top. It's like, well, yeah, that's a little bit true, but it's, you know, it's it's a scientist would look at that and say, yeah, well, probably, you know, power dynamics in a in a functioning economic and political system maybe account for 10% of the variance, something like that, maybe 15%. So, for example, if you have a Say you want to go to an Ivy League school. Well, if your parents went to the school, you're more likely to get in. But you're not that much more likely to get in, and you still have to be, you know, roughly speaking, what happens is that if you have a pretty decent, you know, high school GPA, and you do very well on the SATs, and you have some other talents of some sort, because that's also necessary, then they might pick you over someone else who's roughly equally qualified if you have a familial history of attendance at the school. So obviously you get an, exa- an, an advantage, but it's not, it, it's not the kind of advantage that accounts for the entirety of how the system is structured. It's an advantage. Well, you can say, well, that's not fair. It's like, yeah, okay. Fair enough. Most systems are certainly not 100% either fair or just. Definitely not. <clears throat> but, you know, instead of comparing them to utopia, you might compare them to another system, which is the only reasonable way to do it. It's like everything looks terrible when you compare it to the best thing you can possibly imagine. But the best thing you can possibly imagine is it's an empty fiction because it's so devoid of detailed content that you can't use it as a guide to reality. Now, I mean, the idea that things could be better has its roots in, in some sense, in a broad-scale utopian project, and I believe that things could be better, but that doesn't mean that when you're doing an analysis of a complex system, you get to compare it to an ideological utopia and then describe all the reasons that it's bad. <clears throat> it's not appropriate to do that. It's too simplistic. You're not going to do anything to actually address the problems that the system has if you take that approach. And then, of course, like pure utopian thinking is extraordinarily dangerous because if you think that your way of molding society into some ultimate state of perfection is headed towards some ultimate state of perfection then you can justify absolutely anything you do right now on the basis of the fact that things are going to improve so radically in the future. And that means any of your behaviors are excused. The end is worth it. Well, if someone says that, you have to kind of wonder what they're actually planning... (coughs) Excuse me. What they're actually planning to do. So... (coughs) 